business model of for-profit multinationals that invest in elder care across Europe. We have shed light on how these corporations make big profits on a growing number of people in need. We have followed the money, listened to whistleblowers and reported on mistreatment. Investigate Europe. And then uh, just uh, three hours later, uh, another message from uh, uh, the International Press Institute in uh, Vienna, based in Vienna. They have, a, uh, since 2018, I think, a big uh, investigative journalism program called uh, IJ4EU, or Investigate Journalism for Europe. And uh, they told the happy news that they now relaunch with 1.23 million euros for cross-border investigations in Europe and candidate countries. And uh, they note especially here, journalists in Ukraine are also il eligible for support. So, and then of course we have the ICIJ, the International Consortium, of which we will learn a lot during the next hour. And Fritu is proud to be a co-founder of all of these three. Uh, just a few words about the International Consortium. Their recent collaborations have involved hundreds of the world's best investigative reporters. Working together, they brought down four world leaders and recovered more than 1.4 billion American dollars in unpaid taxes for governments in every continent. And laws have been changed in more than 52 countries as a consequence of the journalism carried out. Multiple people have also gone to jail. And along the way, from Panama Papers and till today, a new kind of cross-border accountability journalism has emerged. And this will be the subject of today's discussion. By the way, it is a paradox that all of this groundbreaking and important journalism, vital journalism, is struggling to fund itself, to finance itself. At least that is the case for the invaluable role that the International Consortium as an organization itself plays in making all this possible, coordinating it, planning it. Uh, the International Consortium relies entirely on donations to do its work. So I would uh, appeal to anyone in the uh, hall here or following us online to consider donations for the International Consortium, small or big. Um, and Norway has been one of the biggest supporters of the International Consortium through grants from the Tinius Trust, NORAD and, and also Fritord. But anyway, it is a fact that cross-border investigative journalism is really alive and kicking and very influential. It's setting so many agendas today. And that is really needed just now these days. For at this exact time, we are waiting for Great Britain's decision on whether to hand over Julian Assange to the US. Uh, I don't think the decision has come yet, has it? No, we are waiting for it. <coughs> uh, if that happens and he is convicted in the US, it could imply the criminalization of investigative journalism globally, that every person anywhere in the world could potentially become the subject for persecution by the US for having published similar information as in the WikiLeaks, regardless of citizenship or where in the world he or she is uh, living. So this is really uh, problems of today. But why then is cross-border investigative journalism so important at this time? Well, reality doesn't stop in this time at national borders in a globalized world. That is why journalists can hardly do their job without being able to see beyond borders. And reality has also become more complex than ever. That is why journalism can profit enormously when reporters come together to find facts and stories that an individual journalist would struggle to expose alone. And democracies depend on transparency and accountability. Holding the powerful to account is a major task of journalism but this has become a real challenge that requires big journalistic muscles and often collaboration across national borders. But the good news then is that cross-border collaborative journalism is happening more and more. 
in the small formats between two reporters in two different countries, via medium-sized collaborations between reporters in a dozen countries, as for example with Investigate Europe, to the projects on the most complex scale with hundreds of journalists from more than 100 media outlets in as many countries participating, as is the case with the International Consortium. <coughs> uh, these new important structures depend on external funding. <coughs> and uh, at Fritjord, as I said, we are proud to contribute to funding several of them, including the International Consortium, the hub that has made possible the biggest journalistic enterprises and collaborations in the history of journalism. So we are so happy to have International Consortium's Executive Director Jared Weil here today, together with investigative reporter Peanas Johansson from Aftenposten, who has participated in several of the global investigations coordinated by an international consortium as a key figure. So welcome to both and welcome also to our moderator, managing editor Ingeborg Eliassen from the cross-border network Investigate Europe. Thank you so much and please uh, come up to the stage. Hi everyone. Um, it used to be a big challenge for journalists to find information. Today's challenge is a bit different. We all bathe in information. We can easily drown in it, and many people do. It remains a professional task and a skill to sift through available information and find that which is relevant and trustworthy and to critically examine it to make sense of it. Journalists do that every day. But not that many journalists have been faced with the task of sifting through and making sense of almost 12 million documents. These two guys here, however, are among those who know what this means. They both worked with the so-called Panama Papers that have already been mentioned, a leak of more than 11.5 million financial and legal records. These records exposed a system that enabled crime, corruption and other wrongdoing. The system was hidden um, by secretive offshore companies. And the records revealed that not only known criminals, but heads of state and celebrities were actively using the system to enrich themselves. And Gerard Ryle, um, so things have already been said about the uh, consortium of investigative journalists and Panama Papers investigations, which was uh, coordinated by you. What remains to be said about what ICIJ is, please? Well, we're a kind of an organization that really started uh, about 25 years ago. We were originally um, a membership organization, members like Pierre Anders here, and it's kind of started as part of another organization called the Center for Public Integrity in Washington, D.C. And the idea was to bring investigative reporters together and then to talk about their skills and to share their skills. Um, about 11 years ago, I took over the organization and I really got the fright of my life because I, I thought this was like a fantastic sounding organization, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. You think it was like hundreds of people. It was actually three people in a basement in D.C. And, oh, sorry. and it was really, um, uh, I, I'd come from the commercial world. I'd been a reporter for about 20 and basically an investigative reporter for about 20 years and I just thought, you know, what am I going to do with this? You know, and a lot of what you see today really came about because of need and necessity. Really, we were up against the wall. We didn't know what we could do. You couldn't really do collaborative or even any kind of investigative reporting with three reporters. So I decided to change the model at that point, and I decided to do what any investigative reporter um, have you know can do for 20 years. You actually know how to find a great story, and I thought, well, if I can find a great story, and then bring it to media partners and convince them to give me their reporters, then I can suddenly have an army of reporters. And it, um, it actually started with a very small story. I brought an idea to the consortium when I took over as director. 
actually wanted to look at the commercialization of human bodies, how dead bodies were turned into medical products around the world. I mean, if you ever wonder why a, an athlete can get up off the soccer field after you know, ruining their cruciate ligament, think about how that's done. In fact, sometimes a cruciate ligament is taken from a dead body and then transplanted into the athlete, and that's how it happens. But also an awful lot of commercial and cosmetic surgery comes from recycled human beings. And I started, we started working on that story. I think we had about eight media partners who were interested in it. And uh, we basically did it the way the Center for Public Integrity did things, which is you, you research a story, you hire a couple of freelance reporters, and then you do the story, and then you approach the media partner at the end of the story, which is what is traditionally done in America. And I went to the Washington Post with, I mean, I basically we researched the story, and we actually found a lot of the bodies that were being used by these American firms on Wall Street were actually coming from Ukraine. And, and you know, when you're taking a human body and stripping of it as various parts, I mean, a human body at the time was worth about $200,000 if you took out its bones and skin and other things. And what they were doing is that, you know, and you need, I guess you also need to know that that doesn't have any pathogens or HIV or hepatitis or other things. They were taking bodies from Ukraine bringing them to Germany, relabeling them as bodies of German bodies, and then bringing them into America, and then turning them into all these different products that were being sold in hospitals around the world. And I went to the Washington Post with a story, and I said, I've got a fantastic story. And my first lesson was, I said, well, how do I know that the research that you're doing um, was real? How do I trust these Ukrainian journalists to know that what we have is real? And that was my first big lesson in that if you want to do this kind of work, you've got to involve reporters from the very beginning and ideally their own reporters because then they trust the story at the end. And that also got around the other big issue we had at the time was how do you actually find an audience for the story once you've done it? And that solved my problem. So a lot of what we've done over the last 10 years, don't think that we walked in there with a great master plan. It was actually by doing things wrong and then by learning from them. But also, it was very much a collective effort. Everybody brought something to the table. Great. And we'll hear much more about how that evolved. Uh, per Anders, uh, can you spell out what the connection between ICIJ and Aftenposten is? I can't remember really when I, <laughs> I went into that uh, organization because it, it was a network of journalists that met at conferences around the world. Uh, and um, I remember, that, I mean, in fact, the first big story uh, that I can remember from my CIG network was all back in 2004 when I was an editor of Chief of News in Aftenposten and we got access to the rules of engagement uh, documents which proved that the Norwegian soldiers in Iraq could be involved in warfare, even though uh, the Norwegian government by that time claimed that this was purely a humanitarian um, mission. But um, I remember very well uh, 2015, I was planning to go to Moscow as a correspondent. I was in the middle of the vacation with my family and then uh, Ryle and his colleagues said that we have to talk and uh, I was sitting on a cafe in Vienna because when, when they call you, you throw away everything. So I stopped my vacation <laughs> and uh, we had a talk about, uh, that, that was the first talk for me about Panama Papers and my job as a journalist then is to of course convince my editors, colleagues that this is something uh, that we should uh, go into. Um, and well, that was the start of a big project, uh, amazing. And um, how many times? If, have if you, you take the, just go nine months uh, after that, I was sitting um, in Moscow in Kutuzovsky Prospect. Have any of you been to Moscow? That's the road that Putin takes when he goes from uh, his home to the work every day. And I was sitting there and uh, writing my part of the Panama Papers, and suddenly there is this emergency press conference in Kremlin and. Uh, Putin's press officer says that Russia, get ready, there is an attack coming, an information attack. And then I suddenly understood that they were talking about what I was sitting there and writing and looking into <laughs> in, my, in my office. I, I felt a little bit scared, of course, but at the same time I knew that I was a part of a, just a fantastic operation with three, four hundred journalists working on the same issues. So I said to myself, there's nothing to be afraid of. This is going to be really exciting. 
Um, so these Panama Papers began with a leak of 11.5 million documents, which is mind-blowing. Um, where do you even start to make sense of something like that? Well, again, by making mistakes. When we, f when we first started doing the offshore work, we actually we had a smaller leak of about two and a half million documents. This was back in 2013. And we had this idea at the time that what we'd do is we'd set up hubs around the world and we'd bring the reporters to the hubs and then we'd, they'd be able to look at the documents and then after three or four days go home to their home countries and write stories. And we quickly realized that this was a total disaster because the reporters needed access to the documents at all times. And this is where we hit on the idea that if you just put everything into the cloud and allow the reporters to look at the rep all of the documents all of the time, you were going to get a much better result. So again, by making mistakes, there was a lot of a long journey from 2011 when I started doing this to 2015 when we were doing Panama Papers, and it was by making the mistakes along the way. We ended up hiring how to make sense of it, we actually build our own technology. We did the Panama Papers, again, on a complete shoestring. Again, we're still sitting there with three people. At this point, I had 10, but we're still working with nothing. We needed to show the reporters all the documents, so we decided to use a system. We used open source software that had been designed for librarians to share their files and to share their book files. And that's how we built our first system that would, would share the documents. And then we also realized we needed a newsroom because we wanted the reporters to go into the online newsroom and to talk about what they were seeing in the documents. Because when you're doing these big projects, you want everybody to share. So if you see the Queen of England on day one, you want to be, you want to be sure that someone is sharing that. But not just that, but also the context around what you're seeing. Because it's very important to have context. So we ended up building another system, which is our online newsroom. And that was actually built using a... Um, software that had been designed for a dating website, because we thought, well, how better to get people to meet than to do that. Now, these days, of course, it's a lot more sophisticated, but that is essentially how we did Panama Papers. We got the reporters together <coughs> to talk about what they were seeing in the documents, and we made all the documents available to the reporters. And it worked a kind of a treat, because we basically worked in secret for almost 12 months. We wrote about hundreds of different politicians around the world. We took on not just Putin, but lots of other, other things. And in fact, I was delighted when Putin called that press conference a week beforehand because it almost guaranteed that the world was going to sit up and take, take notice of this story. And, and so uh, in this preliminary phase, when you sit on the material, you have to somehow find out that, okay, Norway is involved somehow here. So I wonder, Perandas, how, how prepared, you know, how, how, how much sense did the material make when you were presented to it and, and how much remained to be done to make it into something somebody, ordinary people, would want to read? Well, this was not the first leak for me and my colleagues. We, uh, we were also working with the Swiss leaks a few years before, but uh, can you imagine that I was sitting there in Moscow and I had access to everything. Everything was secure. Uh, I was able to work regularly, uh, go in and check what all the other 400 journalists were uh, reading, and uh, and that we were able to, that, that ICIJ were able to provide such a secure working environment. Uh, I think is still amazing, uh, and one of the things that was fascinating. I mean, have you ever seen 400 journalists together? at a conference or anywhere. I mean, it's so chaotic. Nobody wants to listen. Everybody wants to hear their own voice. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's really, um, well, something. And here I CIJ were able to create a digital environment where uh, everything was so efficiently organized. I mean, everybody was creating our own uh, small environments. We found out who was looking at the same documents. We were de developing different ideas, and, and this job was just going on and on for, for months. And of course, we did not know from the beginning <coughs> what we will find, find but, uh, um, but I think one of the things that was also important was that uh, we learned from each other and from the people in ICIJ, which of course had peaked from the beginning. I mean, they needed to have some ideas and hypotheses uh, so that we knew that there will be some fishes to be caught. But, uh, of course, we were all surprised when we saw what uh, we were able to find all together. And you had to do a lot of legwork, I guess, to, to make this into something. Yes, and here there are, of course, differences between, uh, between the different uh, news media and the staffs. I mean, I, 
I thought I worked in a small Norwegian newspaper, but certainly understood that we have just as many journalists as Guardian, mm. and uh, we spe often spent a lot of resources on Panama Papers. More than 20 reporters working for months, and uh, it, it, of course it costs a lot, but um, I mean, like, for instance, discussing what's the story or not. Try to do that with, uh, with the journalists from Russia and uh, Latin America, Frenchmen. <laughs> it, it, we had all those discussions going on on the, all, on the same time, and I think uh, that must have been some of the big challenges for you, because we did not agree always. Exactly, no. this, this yeah. thing about, you, you said yeah. that you had to respect journalistic cultures that I differ, and you know, yes, please expand on that. What is this difference? Well, I think it actually brings a much richer journalism because what we've found is that everyone challenges the same set of facts. So if you're looking, you know, if you're working with 600 reporters in 100 different countries, they're all looking at the same set of facts in different ways. And it does give you a much better perspective, much deeper perspective on what it is you're seeing. And there's a lot of dispute behind the scenes about the interpretation of the facts. And so by the time you actually end up writing a story, you've got a much deeper story. And, and that's probably the one thing that I really like the best about this kind of work, is that we're actually doing as, you know, a much deeper, richer kind of journalism as a result of this. Um, but going back to on how you get the journalists hooked, you've got to give them a story at the beginning. I mean, the whole thing depends on finding a good story for them. But also the early work that we do at ICIJ is we, you know, with the Panama Papers, for instance, we, we started, I mean, the very first job we did was finding the names of all the Norwegians to go to a, a Norwegian journalist. We defined all the names of the Brazilians to go to. And then, then you, it's not like you sit back, but you immediately, you think about it, who best to tell you what's important to Nigeria than a Nigerian journalist telling you, oh, that's an important businessman, oh, that's the brother or the sister-in-law of, of the president. And so you're getting this rich, deep, immediate expertise around the world when you're doing these things. But it doesn't work for every story. I mean, every story you do has got to be this kind of unique, um, it's got to have unique information from each country, otherwise we, we wouldn't be able to get the media partners to, to get involved, because no money changes hands. We don't pay anybody for anything, and we certainly don't pay the reporters. And I don't, like I'm not in charge of the Afton Buston team. They still work to their, to their normal editors, and we don't tell Afton Buston what to even decide what they find in the story. It's up, entirely up to them. Um, I mean, there's a reason for that too, in that we don't have to worry about getting sued in Norway, because it's their problem, not ours, you know. Yeah. But could you, yeah. could you, you had this uh, very, to me at least, very, a uh, fascinating example of how, in, even if it's like that, uh, you have to then take into consideration that people have different ways of working, even when it comes to, uh, for instance, uh, confronting those you ha are investigating. Could you uh, share that? Yeah, I mean, if people remember Panama Papers, we, um, we basically had a lot of world leaders there, and we had a lot of politicians around the world. We had to listen to the reporters as to when to confront people. Now, Perandos is mentioning Putin. Putin was, we, we actually went to Putin last. With some of the, um, the other people we went to many weeks in advance, because in, in America, it's important that you get um, a response from somebody. So we tend to go four weeks in advance. But the Russian reporters were saying, please don't do that, because the moment you tell the Kremlin what's going on, they're going to do exactly what they ended up doing. And so you've got to listen to each reporter. Like, probably the most famous scene from Panama Papers was the Icelandic prime minister. You know? And again, talking about context, we had his name from day one. We, we saw it there, we saw it, here's the prime minister of Iceland, we have a great story. And then when you look deeper, you realize that he had, the context was that he had this secret offshore company he told nobody about. Um, and we saw it in there, but we realized that when he registered the company, he wasn't even a politician, he was a businessman. And so therefore, on the face of it, it wasn't a story. And so we had to bring an Icelandic reporter into the, into the mix. And he was the one who did all of the work that turned that fact into a story. He eventually went through all of the um, the bankruptcy records of the Icelandic banks. If you remember at the time, there was a huge collapse of the banks. And he went through all the bankruptcy records and he realized that this company actually had a financial interest in the banks. And now it became important because here's a prime minister who'd been elected to sort out the financial mess. And it was, he was the one who was going to decide who was going to get compensated for this financial mess. And secretly, he had a company that potentially could have got compensated for it. That is why it became a story, and that took 
That reporter, nine months, and you know, he gave up work. He literally lived off the earnings of his wife during that period of time because he knew that if he told anybody that it was likely that um, it was going to get out. And then in the end, he had all these ethical dilemmas about how he was going to confront the prime minister. And in the end, he decided that if he did it, that the prime minister was going to immediately know what was going, something was wrong and he wouldn't do the interview. So we ended up bringing our Swedish colleagues over to Iceland and that famous scene where he gets up from the, the, the interview and walks out of the room after being confronted with the information, that was all filmed by a Swedish film crew. And again, it's a fantastic example of, of collaboration. I mean, those images, they went around the world. But to finish that, we'd actually given him three weeks to respond. So he had three weeks to knowing that this was coming down the tracks. Whereas Putin, again, the Russians said, please, it's the day before. And we said, no, we can't do it the day before. We'll do it a week before. And then, of course, there was that conference at the, at the Kremlin. And he basically built an audience for the story for us, which was great. Yeah. And they were the most important and the most press famous story from, from that part of the leaks was the story about the, uh, the cellist player, Rui Gosling. I don't know if you remember him. This uh, as a, a musician who suddenly is just insane rich. And uh, he's rich because he is one of the closest friends to Putin. But um, as a journalist working with this case, I was completely free to decide how I would write it. And my editor was uh, completely free to decide how we interpreted it. Uh, and uh, if there are some media researchers here, I think it would be interesting to go in and see how that story would have been interpreted in different ways. The facts were the same, but we made different headlines and uh, we did not agree completely on, 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 on which, uh, which wording on all of these issues. But uh, the, I, I think that as one leak after another, as the years go by, we, became, we spent much more less time quarreling about, you know, how to present it. And I remember very well when we were sitting in Le Monde and discussing a publication of the, of the Swiss leaks because then you had the discussion between the TV companies from different countries, different time zones. No, it was really a <laughs> quite a hard discussion. And uh, when it comes to when to publicize, I think now we, um, at least a little often possible, we accept that uh, somebody has to decide when we do it. And, there you have to have some uh, luck too with the timing because of course uh, um, me as a journalist is timing and some of these issues have been uh, really good timed and that is not something I will boast about. Yeah we, yeah, we were lucky with Panama in that we, um, we had originally planned to publish the story in February in 2016, I think. God, I've lost track of time. And um, yeah, there was a, a minor German election, a local election, and we decided to publish it on the 3rd of April instead. And by coincidence, the parliament in Iceland came back on the 4th of April. So we published our story. And then the next day, the parliament building was surrounded by people and they were throwing yogurt and bananas at the, at the parliament building and demanding the resignation of the prime minister. And of course he fell almost within 24 hours and that of course then ignited this huge firestorm of interest in the rest of the stories. And you know, everything we were doing suddenly became front page around the world and everyone was fighting. All the other publications that weren't involved in the story were now fighting to try and get the next angle and to try and scoop the ones that were in the consortium. But that was fantastic for us because it just kept going and going, you know. Um, mm. But yeah, timing, timing is, is sometimes, you know, pure luck, it's not, not by design. So yogurt, bananas in Iceland and also bringing down the Prime Minister is what we call impact in, uh, mm. in journalism and uh, we love impact. Uh, you also, uh, Knut Olav Omos mentioned some of the real impact you've had, so we will not spend time on that now. But along the way, you have made life uncomfortable for many powerful people. What uh, has been done to try to stop you from doing what you do? Well, I think the hardest part of what we're doing is, is trying to raise the funding to do it, because we're completely reliant on, on public funding. And some of our funders, you know, unfortunately, when we name them, have decided not to um, you know, not to fund us anymore. And also, we're, I keep getting told by people that, you know, you're, you're sawing off the tree that's holding you up because, or the, the branch is holding up on the tree because it's actually rich people that, that tend to um, want to fund this work and yet you keep constantly embarrassing them by, by showing the corruption of the world. Um, in terms of, I think, 
trying to stop us. I think a lot of the reporters that we work with really have been impacted by this. Some have lost their jobs. I mean, um, so, you know, some have been threatened. You know, we, we know when we published Pandora Papers, we had to get all the Russian reporters out of the country. They're the ones that are really suffering. I do think, though, also, and you can maybe back me up here, but there's a, there is a certain safety in numbers that we've managed to, to get. Because there's no point in taking out one reporter when you've got 600 reporters from all these different countries reporting on a story. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if, when you are, f uh, and I think that's one of the most valuable things about working together in projects like that, because mm -hmm. there is a safety. I mean, it's like a small fish swimming around in the sea. You can be eaten. But when you are in a steam, of course, it helps mm -hmm. you. Uh, on physically security, I think. Uh, one of the journalists who had the biggest problems after Panama Papers were the Ukrainian journalists who, who, who revealed a story that we all knew would be big, but perhaps not so big as it became because of the way that the Ukrainian president handled it. But you know, perhaps remember the chocolate king, as he was called, who was supposed to, to clean up the Ukrainian society against uh, corruption and, and many other things. One of the things that the Ukrainian journalist and I say found was that he had already installed and made his own uh, several companies, uh, offshore companies, uh, where he could uh, steal money. And, and the Ukrainian journalists, they were hunted and had a big fight that continued for months, long after everybody else had forgotten about it. Uh, they still had to defend themselves. They were, Poroshenko really tried to, to break them completely. And, uh, I think it's easier to stand in a fight like that when you have uh, colleagues uh, and, um, and it was written also about what is happening. I mean, that's the most yeah. important defense we have, to write about it, write about the threats and write about um, the situation. You, you are uh, bridging over to um, a current issue. Uh, uh, of course, your, your main work uh, depends on leaks, uh, thanks that are possible thanks to, to technology. Um, and uh, you recently again exposed crimes that uh, Kjersti Flekstad mentioned um, that would be seen as threatening Chinese national security interests um, with these uh, camps in the Xiangyang province that often Boston also had last week. Uh, but the people who first demonstrated the power of such leaks when teaming up with media organizations in many countries were Julian Assange and, uh, and uh, WikiLeaks back in 2010. And uh, major newspapers like The Guardian and The New York Times and Der Spiegel and others published uh, what they call the Iraq <coughs> War Logs, which were a, a leak of secret American files that exposed war crimes by American forces in Iraq, which many of you will remember. So uh, the question uh, I'd like to ask is if you should get a leak that threatens U.S. national security interests. What would you do to avoid being hunted, charged, and potentially jailed for 175 years? Which is the situation that Julian Assange finds himself in at the moment? Well, my answer to that is to do it not to make yourself the story, not to make the, any one person in the organization the story, but to make the organization, um, you know, basically you know, stick behind the organization I, would, I, would, I wouldn't hesitate to publish anything. I mean, I have made this comment before, but if I found something on my grandmother, I would, I would publish it, if it's, if it's something that's in the public interest. And I think that you've always got to ask yourself at the beginning, though, you know, when you're getting information, is it in the public interest? And I think that's the only criteria as a journalist, not where it's coming from or, or the background, because everybody giving you information has got some sort of agenda, you know, even, you know, Think of it, even the, the, every major story in the world relies on someone telling a journalist something. So therefore, I would argue that every story is a leak of some kind. It's just a question these days, because of technology, you're able to get enormous amounts of information and you're able to look at enormous amounts of information in a way that you weren't able to before. But I don't know, what, what are your... Yeah. Now, when I feel such a despair and anger when I think of what's happened to Julian Assange, and uh, I remember when we met him here in Norway, many journalists in the beginning, uh, in the absolute beginning, uh, if somebody had told me the, what would happen to him and uh, his destiny after that, I, I would, I mean, it's unbelievable how he has been suffering. And of course, I mean, they've been written books about what happened and we clicks and we're not going to have that discussion now, but I'm absolutely sure that uh, 
as a part of this network and also as a part of my newspaper. I mean, I mean we are doing stories which, uh, where we are, are accused of violating the national security or making <laughs> harm. I mean, that's part of the job uh, in, in different levels, of course. And, uh, and um, the story I mentioned uh, for you in my first ICIG story as, uh, in, in NRK, I mean, after that, the NRK was put under investigation by the National Security Agency, which perhaps became the biggest story. I don't think so many remember it, but it were, uh, NRK was under investigation by the National Security Agency because of the printing of that, uh, that story about the rules of engagement in yeah. Iraq. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, a threat we are facing all the time. And I mean, what can we do as journalists? I mean, we have to, of course, protect ourselves. And it, uh, it's a protection to work together with others, but the biggest and most important thing is to, to, to write the truth, of course. Mm -hmm. The, the, uh, today, at least in Norway, the, the um, journalism and freedom of speech organizations are unison in denouncing the American charges against Assange. But this sympathy has not uh, been at display at all times in these, all these years. And not even by media that um, published information from Wikileaks, such as Aftenposten. Uh, so in, in your... Uh, you know, uh, with 2020 hindsight, uh, how do you assess Aftenposten's legacy in this? Uh, no, I think if you go back and uh, write and, and read the stories we made, because I'm sure you haven't read them either, because uh, it's so long time. We personally have wrote tens of stories based on WikiLeaks, uh, while NRK, blah, blah, many of the media, they were writing about these things that were happening in Sweden and the sex education, but we were writing about what what WikiLeaks really was about. And those stories had impact all over the world. Uh, I would never write those stories again, which really had so many quotes, uh, which were discussed in so many countries. And I think that was the most important thing we did. I mean, that was the whole essence of WikiLeaks, to bring the information out. And, um, and of course, there has been a debate about uh, all, the th all the corners and the crossroads that happened with WikiLeaks and that, but I think that's a different discussion. Now we are talking about uh, the cables, and of course, it's, uh, I, I'm really sad about what happened, but uh, I think um, the fight will have to continue no matter what they decide now. Do you, uh, both of you, do you, if Assange should be extradited to the US, uh, to what extent do you fear that this will not only silence him as a person, but threaten investigative journalism as such? I mean, everybody is not in the ICIJ. No, and, but I mean, I just want to say something about ICIJ here, because I mean, it sounds so big, you know, a consortium, but you know, it's just a few persons. Mm. I, personally, I, I really, I would wonder what would happen if you know, something happened to, Girl here, because I mean, he personally has been uh, so important, and there are so few people around him too. So it seems so big, and the impact is tremendous. But it's really just a few journalists sticking their head together and getting the shit right. You know, it's uh, to say it very simple. And uh, uh, so there, are, these are very small uh, groups, and it has to do with trusting each other, working together, and. I, uh, I was not a part of the WikiLeaks uh, environment. I don't, I, I don't know why they've been writing so many books. Of course, I, I know that something went very wrong, but it has to be, it, it's important when journalists work together that you are able to trust each other, finding ways of solving the conflicts, and always remember what's the most important thing, and that is bringing the story out, of course. Mm -hmm. There's also this issue with, uh, I mean, someone leaks, someone leaks these things to you, uh, and uh, it could be good, uh, big things or small things in, in terms of, uh, of uh, data. But uh, being a whistleblower is uh, also a risky thing. And, uh, and it may destroy your social life, we know that from Norway. It may cost you your job even. It may lead to prosecution. And in some instances, in some places in the world, it could threaten your life. Um, so for journalists, uh, source protection is a big thing, but it's become very difficult to guarantee a source uh, total protection in our digital age. So I wonder how, how can you protect the people who leak to you? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, all the whistleblowers I've ever met they've, that have gone public have had their lives ruined by doing it. Um, it really takes over their life. They, uh, they're either um, 
they just become obsessed with it or you know it the the the, the injustice that takes place in most cases um basically destroys them my answer to that has always been and again you'll see icij's track record here don't don't go public if you're a, if you're a whistleblower just you don't need to i think again it's up to the journalist to assess the public interest in what you're what you're doing but if you go back to Panama Papers, it was a, a person called John Doe. He or she has never been found. Our Paradise Papers project, that person's never been found. Our original story in 2013 that did this has never been found. Pandora Papers last year, the biggest project in history. No one knows who the leaker was. Um, and I think that's the best thing you can do as a journalist to protect your source. Now, that does take an awful lot of hand-holding behind the scenes to make sure that the source is comfortable with that because your natural inclination when you're a whistleblower, if you see something wrong, it's what drives you. You want people to know what you're doing and, and you want to be able to make a statement. I think John Doe from Panama Papers got around that by publishing his manifesto, which again, I think I would encourage everyone to go back and read because it was actually very well written and very well put together. And he, he was basically explaining why he or she did, did that. And, um, and I thought it was very powerful and a fantastic way to handle it. And again, the person's never been found, which is a great outcome. So, so one thing is not kind of marketing yourself as mm. I'm the whistleblower here and uh, yeah. listen to me. This is one thing, but uh, I mean, you leave traces everywhere you, you live, digital traces. Uh, it's, it's been 10, 10, 15 years since at Scoop, the Norwegian uh, conference. Uh, there was a security expert who said, you know, you practically you have to you have to meet your source uh, in in the forest, or you have to put pieces of paper in trees, you know, to to guarantee, uh, you know, uh, how in, can you be more specific on how you can communicate with a source without it leaving that kind of trace? Well, most mistakes made by whistleblowers are made before you actually get to talk to them. The moment you get to talk to them, you can give them advice on, on what to do and how to do it. There are many ways to communicate these days. You don't need to leave traces anymore. I mean, I think those days, certainly at the beginning, it was very easy. What you have to learn is that the security services are not monitoring you 24 hours a day. They're not listening to your phone calls. They don't have time for any of that. But what they can do and what, what they're very good at doing is tracing events afterwards. So cross-referencing your, your flights, what countries went into, um, their call charge records on your phone. They may not be listening to what you're saying on the phone, but they, they can actually work out who you've been phoning. So again, taking very simple precautions as a journalist, you know, not using, you know, having different phones and different different SIM cards and other things, you can actually prevent a lot of that. And also, like, I still think that the best way to, to talk to a source is to actually still meet them, but make sure that, that you know, afterwards can't be cross-referenced. I know you're probably more on the ground than I, I mean, yeah, I, I deal I mean, with, uh, yeah. The, the, yeah. Env the environment for journalists isn't very friendly, mm. not even in Norway mm. either. And uh, uh, it's interesting to think, that, think of that. I mean, have you had any big leaks in this fantastic democratic society we live in? And, and why not? Um, is that because there are nothing big to leak about, or is there something to do with uh, control and and loyalty in the systems? You know, mm -hmm. I uh, um, I mean, we've just been I've been working a lot with investigations during the um, Corona time, and I think there is one interesting similarity which you hear from journalists, even if they work in Russia or in Africa or even here in Europe, and I will also say Norway, and that is that of course the politicians and people power they they really don't like us, and they would do very well without us. <coughs> so uh, when you read to some of the evaluations from the corona, one of the things that the Norwegian government really likes is that they were able to establish a direct line to the people without all these journalists, uh, without all this, this filter, as they call us. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's, the, I mean, in this environment of, uh, of I think, perhaps increasing his uh, hostility, it's important for us as journalists to show that uh, there is a use for us. I mean, in, in Norway, Panama Papers brought back a quarter of a million um, money for, uh, in, in taxes, which could be spent on many important things. And, uh, and I think this uh, showing in the, the purpose of our job is important for whistleblowers too. I mean, these are persons who, uh, so who very often have, have a mission. And of course, the most important thing we can do is to protect them. I mean, if you fail doing that, mm -hmm. um, you have failed completely.
I, I agree with that. But I also think that, you know, on the positive side here, you're actually, we're in a golden era because it's very easy to copy documents. I mean, you know, in the old days of, um, you know, like Watergate or those, I mean, to pass information, you had to go into an underground car park and talk to people. These days, someone can just go in with a thumb drive and take huge amounts of documents and then pass them on to journalists. And a lot of um, the raw material we, we need, you know, is following that paper trail. I mean, that's really our job at that point is, is to, you know, and it's really hard. I mean, I haven't done this now for a long time. It's really hard to dispute. Even Putin couldn't dispute Panama Papers because we had the documents, we had the documentary evidence. I mean, you mentioned that story about the cello player. We were able to trace $2 billion in, in money going through offshore accounts to a guy that even the Russian reporters were telling us, this guy is not important. You know, he might be the, the godfather of Putin's eldest daughter, but he's actually not an important figure. And yet the documents were telling us he was incredibly important. And even Putin couldn't deny that. And in fact, all he could say that in the end, he said, oh, the money's been used to buy cellos. I mean, that was his only answer. I mean, <laughs> you know. We have 10 minutes to go, or a, less, uh, a little bit less. And uh, it means uh, there will be an opportunity for you to ask uh, questions yourselves. If you signal, uh, yes, we will have a mic. And you can prepare uh, your question while I ask uh, uh, is there anyone who has one burning? Yes, you do. Okay, so let's uh, let's just uh, have you come forward and pose it here. And please say who you are and uh, and uh, question, please. Uh, hi, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, my name is Karoline Micic, uh, and I was wondering. So I think uh, all of us here are pretty convinced by this initiative. Seems really great. Um, but I was wondering about how do you decide who's, who's included and who's not? Because basically, you talked about this earlier a little bit, you're talking about competition between journalists, which obviously is happening, you're not paying the journalists, they're working for themselves, they have a good story, and then the ones who are not in the consortium are going to tag on and also write their own story. So how do you decide who you invite to be in with the consortium, and then how do you ensure that there's no competition within the group so that it continues to work well? Yeah, a, a great, great um, question. Um, well, first of all, we're open to any media organization in the world. I mean, the ideal way to, to get involved with ICIJ is actually come to us with a story that we can share with everybody, and we'll put you at the center of that. You know, going back to Panama Papers, it was two German journalists that got the documents, and they had worked with us on previous stories, so they wanted to be part. They'd actually seen what it was like to be in the middle of a story. Now they're superstars. I mean, they're international superstars as a result of that. That's the best way to, to get involved with ICIJ. It's, it is very important that we have the right mix of media partners. There's no point in having two you know, really competitive newspapers working in, a, in, in something like this because the whole idea is that we, we all publish together on the same day at the same, exactly the same hour. We, I mean, those big debates go on as to when we're going to publish. But it is very important that you have trust. And if you've got two rivals, it's not going to work. Ideally, we like to look for like, a radio station, a TV station, and a newspaper in each country. That's our ideal mix. But we're happy to mix it around. I mean, we, we, this is not a club. This is not an exclusive thing. We're, we're really entirely story driven. But I mean, maybe you could talk a little yeah. bit about to the sensitivities. It's really important that, that you don't have those internal rivalries as you go up. You need to be able to, if you see your grandmother, you have to tell us that she's there. No, I, I, I grew up in Oz, not so far from Oslo, and you know, my, my um, life as a child was driving around with a bike and a football on the back and trying to find somebody who, uh, who wanted to play with me. You know. And you know, this is some kind of the same thing. But when often Posten, I've been a member for a long time, but not as a member, of, as a journalist, often Posten or in an arcade, but just because I, I happened to meet some people a long time ago when we worked with some stories and something more, and it's... As you go along, people develop trust. It's not so complicated, but um, uh, often it was not a part of the beginning of your leaks because then uh, these Americans, <laughs> they want to have TV companies, they want to have NRK, and uh, uh, of course I was sitting and uh, I was a part of ICIJ, but they did choose to work with NRK on that story, and uh, I was sitting and following how that developed, of course, and. And uh, I, tr I tried to, I contacted ICG, yes, I met with the people there, we worked the other stories, and uh, I was, I think that if NRK had been doing a better job, perhaps uh, it would never have been a chance for us. But yeah. uh, the, uh, for me, it had been, has been very important that 
often posted when we have been invited in, we have been doing this as good as we can. And if we had not done that, I mean, there, there will be somebody else. It's not, not more complicated than that, but we have uh, many friends and colleagues in this big network who, are, who has not been part of these leaks. And I, of course, there are some scars there that will never, never heal, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> I mean, it's funny that you, you, know, you asked the question because at the beginning, like 11 years ago, I remember spending hours outside editors' offices trying to convince them to actually do this. And we really struggled to find media partners who were willing to work with us. Now we have, or like now we have people every, almost every day emailing us saying, I want to work with you now. So it's fantastic that we've actually changed that attitude because getting them to share was actually quite difficult. And now that they've seen it work, it's, you know, it's also really heartening to see so many other organizations doing that. You mentioned earlier all of the other organizations that are now doing collaborative reporting. It's a whole new kind of journalism that we've spawned as a result of showing that it works. And the challenge going forward, of course, is to make sure that it, you don't have some disaster and you don't have them all shrinking back into their shells again. You know, and that means getting the story right. And I do think that you know, we have a responsibility to, to become more and more professional in 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 executing this because what we tend to do does get followed and I do think I'm, my, my biggest worry about ICIJ is that we get something wrong or you know, we, we, we get a story wrong or we, we find a story that, that doesn't actually work for us and then the media partners don't want to work with us again. So there's a lot of pressure on finding that next story. And, you know, and I also found that when I was building at the beginning, you know, after I'd given up on waiting outside editors' offices, I actually went to the reporters and realized it was, that was the way to do it, to talk to a reporter, and then let the reporter do all the advocacy inside the newsroom to get the resources to do this. Because if you give a, a good story to an investigative reporter, they will do anything to get that story. And, and, and it's also very important that it becomes their story, not ICIJ. So again, going back to the organization, it's very important that ICIJ is in the background. We're a service. We're not front and center. We're, we don't want to be in the limelight. We want to be behind the scenes, you know, bringing the stories to the media partners. Mm -hmm. So that was the question that uh, brought really rich answers. And uh, uh, time is running out. Uh, 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 I'd like to ask you, Derek, for one last short uh, a response to this. You've had collaborations involving over 600 journalists at one time. Uh, where do you go from here? Well, my ambitions are that if we had actually, you know, if we were actually properly funded, you can imagine what we could do. You know, if we had a thousand reporters and, you know, 500 media companies around the world all working together, we could, you know, we could bring down a dozen governments, you know. I, I, <laughs> I, I think it's like what I despair about having having now seen what I've seen is the amount of corruption that's out there that we don't know about. I mean, the contracts for big purchases by governments, probably your government as well. You, you, when you actually see that if you're buying, you know, a 55 trains for your for your railway, that the the embedded amount of corruption that's in every single, almost every single purchase around the world is. Uh, I, I despair because I just think there's so much for us to do and we're not able to do it because we're such a small organization. I have six reporters, that's all I have. So I have 38 people working for me, 10 of them are technologists building the technology that we need. I have a huge data team of 10 and so I've really only got six reporters and three editors and we operate like a magazine because apart from giving the stories to the media partners, we also do the global story while everyone else does the, the local story. And we make those stories available, a little bit like, you know, like Reuters or AP, before the publication. And they can use the stories if they want to or not. Again, we don't take responsibility for anything because we only want to be publishing in the US. But yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, give us 100 million, give us 300 million. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, yeah. And, uh, with that organization, they are about one-tenth or something of the PR officers in Equinoid or... Uh, or, uh, or the PR officers in the, the, in the ministry. Yes. So it, it, it's a small uh, It's nothing. So with this appeal to whoever, I'm looking at uh, Knut Olav uh, <laughs> 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 uh Thank you very much, both of you. And, uh, and uh, now uh, Kjersti Flegstad. Yeah, a very yes. short thank you to uh, Gerald Bry, Per Anders uh, Johansen, and you, Ingeborg Eliassen, for fulfilling my expectations, at least. And I feel that this is, was, was circle uh, ended uh, from 
December when we had uh, um, Dmitry Muratov and Maria Ressa courageously talking about journalism here, and now you ending this Nobel Talks with this uh, um, uh, upbeat uh, and a very optimistic uh, look uh, for the future on journalism and what it can do and uh, really how, how it can secure the society going forward. So thank you so much for uh, sharing this story with, uh, with, uh, with us. Uh, this was the last Nobel Peace Talk before summer. We have had a series of 10, all with very high quality and a lot of uh, good content. They are available as podcasts or at streams at the Nobel Peace Center's website. This will also be available. So if you want to share it on social media after this, please do. It will be available quite soon. And thank you so much, Knut Olav Omos and Fritt Ur, uh, for supporting uh, this uh, uh, series and this event, and to Hydro, Luminit and Reitan Retail, also our supporters. Um, on 1st, 2nd and 3rd of September, we're going to have Freedom of Expression Festival and Freedom of Expression Conference. So we're going to end off the whole year with quite a big bang and perhaps we will see you again. What do I know? And thank you so much for coming. Thank you. <laughs>